Great. So uh, thanks everyone for joining. And uh, today is uh, the ninth lecture of um, our course on geometric deep learning, and we'll be talking about manifolds. So I will remind you that we started with this uh, 5G of geometric deep learning, where uh, uh, we described uh, grids, groups, and graphs uh, in the last lectures. And uh, today we'll be talking about the, the, the last Gs, uh, the geodesics and gauges. So uh, we'll be talking about manifolds, uh, meshes, and geometric graphs. I will be talking mainly about um, manifolds and some basic terms. And then uh, Taco will continue in, uh, in his lecture about uh, the broader uh, gauge theory and the, the concepts of uh, bundles. So uh, if you remember this table with uh, different popular architectures of deep learning as instances of our geometric deep learning blueprint. So in case of uh, uh, manifolds and the architectures we are considering are intrinsic or mesh convolutional networks, we actually have two different symmetry groups. We have the, the, uh, what is called the isometric group that describes the deformations of the manifold and the gauge symmetry that describes the local uh, transformations. The local ambiguity, will, uh, uh, I will show exactly what I mean by this uh, in a few minutes. Uh, maybe let's start with the, the question at all, why we need manifolds? So for computer scientists, this is uh, somewhat of an exotic object, right? And um, if you think of problems like computer graphics and computer vision, there are main, the two main reasons why manifold is a good model for three-dimensional objects. So just to, to settle the terminology, and again, we'll talk about it uh, in, a few, in a few minutes, when we talk about 3D objects, we can describe them in two ways. We can think of uh, three-dimensional volumes, right? Or we can think of the boundary, uh, the boundary surface of these three-dimensional volumes, which are two-dimensional manifolds. These are surfaces, right? So if you think of, so if you look at this Stanford bunny, uh, if you represent it volumetrically and you are interested only on the outside surface, right, the, the 3D object, then you don't care of what happens inside. So in a sense, this uh, volumetric representation is very, very wasteful. It, it describes a lot of information that you don't need. In some applications, you do need this information, like in medical imaging, where you care actually about what's inside rather than what's outside, right? But in computer graphics, for example, if I want to render this model, I don't see anything that's inside. So in this case, a surface or a discrete version of a surface, what we call a mesh, would be a much more um, uh, appropriate representation. Another thing is that when you uh, describe surfaces as, um, uh, when you describe 3D objects as surfaces, uh, it is very natural to model their deformations. And that's why when we are dealing with deformable shapes like the human body, right, different applications and virtual and augmented realities, uh, uh, 3D avatars and so on, then uh, it lends itself very naturally to these kind of representations. Now, another maybe a slightly exotic application, and we'll probably talk about it more in the, the final lecture on applications. Uh, now, uh, a, a field that has exploded recently of protein modeling. So this is also a very geometric field. You can think of uh, uh, protein molecules, right? So they are 3D objects, they are 3D structures. And uh, if, for example, you want to predict the interactions of proteins, what chemists call binding, then you don't really care about what's inside. Usually it's uh, only the outside, uh, outside surface that matters for the interaction. So this is a way of abstracting out uh, some of the internal structures that might be irrelevant for a given problem. Now, uh, I remind you that when we talked about groups, uh, what Taco described in his lecture, uh, so there was a prominent notion of uh, homogeneous spaces, right? And an homogeneous space where you can take any point and transform it into another point by means of a, uh, a group element, right? So on a sphere, for example, I can rotate any point U to any other point V. And uh, this will be a unique element of the group that, that uh, performs this rotation, right? So in a sense, there is a complete democracy between all points in the space. On general manifolds, we don't have these luxuries. So we, we cannot find, for example, uh, an element of the group that moves uh, points, uh, uh, moves from one point to another point, at least globally. You, you might have uh, might be able to do it locally on some manifolds. But uh, the, the, the shortcoming is that we now need to talk about paths. And when it comes to paths, there, there are multiple ways to go from U to V, right? Like the, the, the red one and the green one. Now, what comes as a drawback with this, uh, with this view is the following, that if you think of Euclidean convolution, right, what we've seen on, on grids and in the plane, uh, I can uh, think of it roughly speaking as take a local filter, right, that is shown here, and move it around the domain, right? So here I show you uh, two ways of moving it around, uh, the, the red way and the, 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 the green way, 
you see that the result will be the same. The filter uh, will arrive at the same position and the same orientation. But this is not the case on the manifold. Even on a manifold like the sphere, if I move along the red path or if I move along the green path, I will get to a different result. So the result of a transport, what we'll call the parallel transport, is path dependent. So in this case, the ambiguity is rotation. You see that when I arrive uh, at a differently rotated filter, right? I can rotate it by 90 degrees and get the same result. Uh, if we have some more exotic structures, such as non-orientable manifolds, of which uh, the, the Mobius surface is probably the, the classical example, you see that in this case, basically, uh, a non-orientable means that if I, I plot the normals of this surface, it will be, be discontinuous. So if I move along the green path, or if I move along the red path, I will flip the filter, right, because of lack of orientability. So in this case, the ambiguity is reflection transformation. So there are several recipes how we can try to do something similar to convolutions on manifolds. Uh, we can fix the path. We can say that uh, I move uh, my filters along a certain path that we'll call a geodesic. So this has been done in the literature. I will not be talking about this idea. We can uh, fix uh, this gauge, this local system of coordinates, and we'll talk about it in a second. We can do what is called uh, group pooling. So we'll apply some uh, pooling on the, the local transformations. We can do isotropic filters that are uh, unaffected by this ambiguity, or we can do uh, what is called gauge equivariant filters, and uh, this will be the topic of the next uh, lecture by Taco. So I mentioned two types of symmetry. Uh, one of them was this local gauge transformation, right? The fact that uh, on manifolds I am forced to work only locally, and therefore uh, I'm dependent on an arbitrary choice of the system of coordinates, which I can transform in arbitrary way. So this is called the gauge symmetry. And I will only briefly mention it again. This will be uh, addressed in the lecture of Taco. Another kind of uh, symmetry or uh, invariance that we are interested in is what uh, is called a global um, uh, isometric deformations. So I want to, de to be able to deform my domain, my manifold, and uh, still guarantee that the, the filters produce the same results. Right? This is important, especially in graphics applications, but this is a more general principle on which we touched only briefly. So this will be also an opportunity to talk about this deformation invariance. OK, so the outline for today, we'll start with how to define local stuff on manifolds. Right? Basically, this will be uh, given in the form of Riemannian metric. And then how to move stuff around locally. Uh, we'll talk about uh, parallel transport and geodesics. Then we'll talk about uh, deformation invariance isometries. Uh, I will not, as I said, I will not talk about local symmetries and gauges. This will be uh, in the next lecture. And then we'll talk about a particular instance of these filters. Uh, this will bring, uh, the, the, bring up the topic of spectral analysis and Fourier transforms on manifolds. We'll see that also these concepts apply uh, almost straightforwardly to graphs and uh, will somehow close the loop and talk about some uh, topics that Petra only briefly mentioned in his lecture. Okay, so what is a manifold? And probably for computer scientists, uh, this is uh, somewhat of an exotic uh, object. I should say that if I were to define everything properly, I will probably spend at least a couple of hours just uh, uh, making the definition. So let me uh, be a little bit uh, inexact here, right? And what I mean by manifold is, the following uh, notion of a topological space, right? So topological space is roughly where we have a notion of a neighborhood, but not distance. So it's a kind of very flexible form of geometry. I only want to preserve, uh, uh, to, to preserve uh, some form of neighborhood, okay? It has a formal definition. That's what we call topology. So this is topological space that locally resembles a Euclidean space. What do I mean by this is that if I take a point and a small neighborhood around it, I can uh, map it into a, a Euclidean space, right? Now, uh, we'll be usually considering smooth manifolds or differentiable manifolds. And this means the following thing, that if I have two different points and the neighborhoods around them, I will map them to the, uh, to the respective Euclidean spaces. There is some overlap between these uh, neighbor neighborhoods, right? So this uh, green area. So the transition functions between re these green areas, basically a, a way to map uh, between these two different representations must be smooth, okay? Meaning that it's differentiable uh, uh, many times and, uh, uh, and the derivatives are continuous. And we'll assume that it's uh, continuously differentiable uh, sufficient number of times. That's what is typically mathematicians uh, mean when they say uh, that something is smooth, okay? So S-dimensional manifold uh, is locally homeomorphic. Uh, basically, uh, there is a, a 
a, a, a bijection that preserves the topology uh, to an S dimensional Euclidean space, right? So what I draw here is a surface, so it's a two dimensional manifold. Don't be confused with the fact that it's embedded or lives in a three dimensional space, right? I realized this manifold in R3, but I could also realize it in R50. The manifold exists on its own, right? It doesn't need to be drawn or uh, embedded into any space, right? So it's a, an abstract uh, object. Okay, so um, locally we can attach uh, this uh, S-dimensional uh, Euclidean space, we call it the tangent space, right? So, uh, what is important to realize that at each point we have a different tangent space, even though they are equivalent, they are not the same. Okay, and that's really the important point, and that's why we say that uh, manifolds are locally Euclidean. Right, and the, the collection of all these uh, tangent spaces, or what technically is called the, the disjoint union, is called the tangent bundle. Right, so you can think of it roughly as if I have a collection of um, uh, Euclidean spaces that are attached to this manifold. Right, so the, the, the manifold is a, is a ground object. Taco will talk about a more general construction of vector bundles that generalizes this concept that the, the ground space doesn't need to be necessarily the uh, uh, necessarily manifold. Okay, now vectors in this tangent space uh, locally uh, allow to model displacement. So we'll see that uh, this is the correct notion of directional derivatives on manifolds, right? So it tells, it tells you that if I move from point U in the direction of X, uh, I change something, right? So some stuff flows on the manifold or maybe a value of a function will change in some way. We'll talk about it in a second. Now, what is very important to realize that this vector is coordinate free. It's an abstract notion. And this is really a mental shift that you need to, to, to make because usually, uh, even at school, you are told that vectors are arrows or arrays of numbers. So vectors are neither arrows nor arrays of numbers because an abstract vector space doesn't have the structure uh, that uh, allows to think of uh, vectors as arrows, right? It doesn't have direction. Direction comes from inner product. So uh, this, uh, this is true in, um, in, in the Euclidean space where there is a natural inner product, but in general, a vector space is abstract. You can only uh, add vectors and multiply them by scalars. So you don't have a notion of direction, right? And it's also not an array of coordinates. So to represent a vector as an array of coordinates, and this is really what you must do if you want to represent vectors on a computer and do something with them, you require some local basis, right? So we need some uh, uh, reference frame with respect to which we represent uh, a vector in coordinates. And uh, this is what physicists call a gauge. So you can think of a gauge as a collection of these invertible linear maps that are smooth with respect to, the, to their position on the manifold that essentially assign coordinates to the tangent vectors on the manifold, okay? So you can represent them as uh, an array of uh, S numbers. So here the convention uh, uh, varies and uh, some people uh, denote the gauge as a map from the tangent space to the, to the Euclidean space. Here I use the, the opposite, okay? So basically it maps uh, vectors from the Euclidean space to tangent vectors at, at the point. What is important that it's defined per point and it can be different. Okay, so this is a coordinatization of uh, tangent vectors. Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, topology uh, I mean, uh, is a kind of uh, uh, flexible geometry, right? Where you don't have uh, any, uh, any, uh, any structure. You can bend your, uh, uh, your, your manifolds the way you want. Uh, yeah, so the component of the tangent vector, there is a question, is it invariant under coordinate transformations? It is not, right? And that's that's really the important part. We'll get to it. So this is an excellent question. Um, or usually it's not. Okay, so this is uh, probably one of the classical examples, right? Or uh, topologist uh, jokes that you can take, uh, uh, basically you can have a, a double breakfast. You can take uh, your, uh, uh, your coffee mug, drink your coffee and then deform it uh, into a donut and then eat the donut. Right, so that's that's a topologist breakfast, and uh, what it means for us that uh, we need some extra structure. And in differential geometry, this structure typically comes in the form of what is called the Riemannian metric. So Riemannian metric, it sounds like a fancy thing, but it's uh, just a local inner product on the tangent space. I will denote it by uh, this uh, bilinear form G, with subscript U to say that it's a metric at point U, or uh, just an inner product with sub subscript U to say again that this is inner product. At this point, okay. So it takes two inner uh, two, two tangent vectors. It produces a number, okay, like any inner product. Uh, 
Okay, so it gives us essentially a way to measure uh, locally angles, uh, length, and area. Okay, as, as shown here. Again, as we uh, uh, if we attach some uh, some local frame to, to the tangent space, we can express express the the, um, the Riemannian metric as an S by S matrix that must be positive definite, and uh, essentially this is its expression with respect to coordinates. What and what is important that. Uh, Basically, this is a characteristic of the structure of the Riemannian, uh, Riemannian manifold. Uh, we will call properties that can be expressed entirely in terms of the Riemannian metric as intrinsic. So this will be a recurrent term that you will hear today. And we are interested in intrinsic properties because basically what we'll try to show that if we deform the manifold uh, without changing the metric, uh, we will preserve a lot of interesting properties that we can then use to do deep learning. And for example, these kind of situations will not be possible. So this will not be uh, uh, an isometry, basically a transformation that pre uh, that preserves the metric, right? So this is too much uh, uh, a free form transformation of our manifold. We we'll want something uh, more uh, 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 more restricted. Okay, another important topic uh, that another important uh, notion in differential geometry is the notion of geodesics. So let's do the following thing. So let's take two points u and v and let's connect them by a curve okay so a curve is just well as is shown here so it's it's a function that maps from an interval let's say uh, from zero to, to t capital to to the manifold okay so i can parameterize think of uh, a car that uh, drives from uh, from ctu to ctv okay so at time zero it starts at ctu at time t it arrives to ctv and it can go in some way okay so i can measure the local velocity of the car Basically, I do it by taking the derivative of the curve with respect to the time parameter, right? And it gives me a vector. So this is a tangent vector. At each point, it lives in the respective tangent plane, right? So at point t, it's a tangent vector uh, at the tang tangent, uh, uh, tangent plane or tangent space at the point uh, uh, gamma of t, OK? And now I, can, I have a way to measure the length of the curve, because if I uh, basically, if I think of the curve as a collection of these linear segments, right, the local velocity vectors, so basically I just integrate the velocity uh, we, uh, along the curve, right, and the length uh, is given by the Riemannian metric, right, the square root of the, the inner product of the, the velocity vector with itself, I will give the length, I will get the length of the curve, okay? And a special kind of curve that minimizes the length between two points is called the geodesic. So if you're familiar with differential geometry, you will probably know that there, are, there is a, a more general abstract way of defining geodesic. Let me get to it uh, in a second. But for us, this will be a definition of geodesic. Okay. And geodesics are intrinsic. You can also see it from here because we expressed everything in terms of the Riemannian metric, right? So I don't have any, any other structures here. Now, this allows us to define distances. And well, technically speaking, it's called the metric because we reserve the term metric for the Riemannian metric. I will try to avoid this confusion. I will call it a distance, but basically we can define, uh, we can measure distances or we can, uh, uh, we can measure distances between points on the manifold, global distances uh, by connecting them by geodesic and uh, measuring the length of this geodesic, right? And this will be uh, uh, the minimizer, uh, a geodesic, this, uh, this path will be the minimizer of the length of all curves that go from U to V. Uh, this menu actually exists, right? So this is the first question that you ask uh, if you're a mathematician, right? Whether uh, something that I, uh, a minimum like this exists, usually it's an infimum, but if the manifold is connected, then, then uh, we can say that the minimum is actually realized. So there exists a path that realizes this, uh, this distance and it defines uh, a complete metric space, right? So it's metric space is uh, a space where we, we have some uh, notion of distance uh, between every pair of points. Okay, uh, question, how can you measure the length of a geodesic? So this is what I defined before. So this is the length of any curve, right? I just uh, uh, integrate the, the velocity vectors along the curve, and this gives me the length of any curve, a particular uh, curve that minimizes this length functional between uh, given points uh, is called the geodesic, right? So that's how we define the geodesic. Okay, and uh, basically this defines a complete metric space. Completeness here is understood in the standard mathematical sense that every Cauchy sequence converges, right? Uh, 
And what is important that this distance is also intrinsic. Okay. Now, there is an important result in differential geometry that is uh, called the hopf reno theorem that uh, um, establishes equivalence between metric completeness and uh, what is called the geodesic completeness, about we, uh, which we talk um, later. And uh, again, uh, this requires some technical conditions, but let's say all the good manifolds that we consider uh, satisfy these properties. So that's why we can use uh, the two terms uh, uh, equivalently. Now, the important point from which we started, right, how to define a convolution basically was, let's take uh, some local thing and move it around the, uh, our domain, right? And this brings the question, how to move a vector from point U to point V, okay? Now, what we can do is the following thing, that we can define a geodesic with uh, two endpoints, U and V, right? And uh, we can define a family of vectors X parameterized by this parameter T. They will live in the respective tangent spaces. And we want the following thing, that first of all, the length of the vector is preserved along the curve, right? And second, we want the angles to the velocity vector uh, to be preserved, okay? So this is what is called uh, uh, that X is parallel transported along the curve gamma, okay? And out of all the possible curves, so if I give you a different curve, it will be transformed in a different way, right? Remember this ambiguity that I showed in you in the beginning that uh, even on the sphere or uh, on a general manifold, going along different paths will bring us to a different result, right? So that's exactly the idea of parallel transport. Out of all the possible curves, I can select V1, which is the geodesic, right? And that's a kind of canonical way of moving a vector from one point to another, okay? So in other words, this parallel transport, or sometimes it's called a connection, uh, basically it's a mechanism to transform vector between tangent spaces, okay? And uh, it is intrinsic, right? Because, well, we define it through geodesic, which uh, depends only the Riemannian metric. It amounts on uh, manifold with Riemannian metric uh, only to rotation, right? So we'll see that it's uh, an element of a, a special orthogonal group. And uh, again, if you're familiar with differential geometry, you would know that parallel transport is defined in an abstract way through the notion of covariant derivative that can actually be defined independently of the Riemannian metric. And what we defined here is a special kind of uh, uh, connection or parallel transport that is called the levi civita connection that is torsion free and compatible with the Riemannian metric. And uh, there is a fundamental theorem that establishes that there is a unique such connection. So what we defined here is uh, the way of tra transporting uh, vectors on the Riemannian manifold, okay? Now, once we have a geodesic, basically what we know that locally around the point, uh, it is always possible to, uh, to define a geodesic that will start at that point and will go in certain direction, right? So that the, the velocity vector at the point U will be given to some tangent vector uh, that I chose, right? So basically I can shoot geodesic starting from a point and going in a certain direction. Now, it doesn't mean that I can do it indefinitely, but if I can do it, we say that the manifold is geodesically complete, right? So that's the notion of geodesic completeness that I mentioned before, that uh, the hopf of theorem told us that it's equivalent to metric uh, completeness, okay? So basically I can, uh, I can start with a point in the direction, I can travel on the manifold as long as I can until I get tired infinitely. Long, okay, and this allows us to create a, a, a very useful construction that is called the exponential map that is defined by basically taking a unit step along the geodesic in a certain direction, and this takes us from a tangent, tangent space to a manifold. So basically, I can what I can do with the exponential map, I can work in the tangent space and then go back to the manifold. Right, or I can do the other way around. I can say I have a function on the manifold. I can bring it back to the tangent space locally, right around the point. So it's uh, it's a natural way of mapping between these two spaces. It is intrinsic, right? We define it in in terms of geodesic. But uh, what is important to understand that the, that the geodesic completeness doesn't guarantee that exponential map is a nice map. So it's not necessarily a global diffeomorphism, even though I can travel uh, along geodesic as much as I can, uh, if I apply this uh, exponential map globally to map uh, uh, a tangent vector to the manifold, uh, it might look ugly, right? So it might be, be non-smooth. And uh, therefore we uh, want to localize it and uh, the radius for which this uh, um, 
uh, a small region of radius r, a metric ball of radius r around the point is mapped uh, diffeomorphically is called the injectivity radius. So it's a local property of the manifold. And uh, this is why we will need to work locally on manifolds. Okay. So this brings us to the notion of basically why we started all this stuff, right? How to do conversion on manifolds. So conceptually, we can do the following thing. So we have a signal on the manifold, right? Some function. We have some local filter. We can define it on the tangent space. And uh, naively, right, we can say that, okay, let's map the function locally to the tangent space at point Q using an exponential map. So here it is. I compose X by signal with exponential map. And now I express everything in the tangent space, right? The filter uh, uh, multiplied by the, uh, uh, by the local uh, uh, version of this function. And then I integrate everything. Do you think that works, this kind of approach? So the answer is it doesn't, right? Because here, again, I remind you, these are abstract factors. I have no way, basically, if I want to represent it on a computer, I have no idea what to do with this y, right? So I really need to represent it in coordinates as arrays of uh, numbers, right? And this requires me to uh, express my vectors with respect to some gauge, with respect to some local, uh, local reference, right? So this integral is well-defined. The problem is that if I change this gauge, right, so this convolution, I must specify that it's uh, given a certain gauge. If I choose a different gauge, I will get a different result. So somebody asked the question whether the, the, uh, whether the, the expressions will be the same if I change the gauge. So the answer is no, right? It, there is no reason whatsoever why the gauge uh, the result will be the same if I uh, locally transform my, uh, uh, my, my system of coordinates, okay? And this is a big problem. So maybe a more general uh, uh, comment, and uh, I um, provided also the link to, to this uh, nice recent paper by Maurice Weiler and others that uh, uh, writes on 250 pages about um, intrinsic convolutions on manifolds. So the gauge is defined up to a transformation. So this transformation, it's called the gauge transformation. Uh, we can think of it as a, a group, right? So it's called sometimes the structure group of, of, of the manifold or the tangent bundle. And it really depends on uh, what kind of structure you assume. So if you assume a naked manifold without any uh, metric structure, right? So just topological space, then this transformation can be anything, right? So any invertible matrix, what we call the general linear group. If we have uh, oriented manifold, right? So it's manifold uh, with orientation. So it excludes these kind of path pathologies like the Mobius surface, then it's uh, what is called GL plus. So it's invertible matrices with positive determinant. So we have some fixed orientation. But again, my, my system of uh, uh, coordinates can be transformed in any way, right? I can skew it, I can scale it, I can do whatever I want. I only preserve the handedness, right? So I introduce some extra thing. Now, if we also have a volume form, right? If I can measure volumes on the manifold, it can be done uh, without Riemannian uh, metric. We can define an abstract volume form. Then we have the, what is called the, uh, the SL. So it's matrices with determinant equal to one, right? But again, there is a lot of degrees of freedom within it. If we have a metric, then we can measure uh, angles. And now we can talk about uh, orthogonal transformation of our frame, right? But orthogonal matrices include uh, rotations and reflections, right? So I can change the handedness. So again, if I add uh, to metric the orientation, I have orthogonal matrices that preserve the orientation. So they have determinant one, right? And that's what we have with Riemannian metric because Riemannian metric provides us both volume and, or, uh, and uh, we assume that the manifold is oriented. Finally, if I have some prescribed frame field, if I can attach a gauge to the manifold in some way, then we don't have any ambiguity. In this case, the group is just the identity, right? So I have the way, the canonical frame, right? And here's an example. So on the general manifold that has orientation, uh, my ambiguity is S of two, right? I can rotate locally my local frame any way I want. If I have some non-orientable surface like the Mobius, I can also have reflections. And if I have a fixed gauge, like on the sphere, for example, I can derive a canonical parametrization with the exception of the two poles. Uh, basically, I have no ambiguity at all, okay? So as I said, uh, on the Riemannian manifolds, we are not interested in the, the, the more general cases. We are interested only in rotations or the case where we can attach the canonical frame field. So in theory, uh, we cannot really define such a field. In practice, we can, right? So that's the idea of uh, assigning a fixed gauge. And there are multiple ways of doing it. So you can actually define uh, 
uh, uh, stable procedures for for uh, for determining local frames. One of them was described uh, in uh, in our paper in CVPR uh, two years ago. We call it G frames, and the idea is to take an intrinsic function, such as, for example, uh, one of the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. We'll talk about it in uh, in a few minutes, and then take its intrinsic gradient. Again, we'll talk about what intrinsic gradient is in, in a few minutes. So it doesn't really give you a, a completely unique gauge because there might be some points where it's not well defined. So and uh, actually results in differential geometry guarantee you that you must have such points. If you're familiar with the Kopf-Poincaré theorem, uh, what is called the hairy ball theorem. So uh, anything that looks like a sphere topologically uh, cannot have a, a smooth tangent field attached to it, right? So if you think of of my hair, right? If I try to comb it, there will be one point where I have a vortex, right? Where this field must vanish. This is actually one of the reasons why when you have these confinement chambers for plasma, they must have toroidal shape. You cannot have, uh, you, uh, you can comb a torus, you cannot comb a sphere. You cannot be spherical chambers, okay? So another alternative, uh, this is what we did actually, this was the first uh, um, paper on intrinsic convolutional networks on, on manifolds is a procedure that we call anchor pooling. And for two-dimensional manifolds, you can express everything in local uh, polar coordinates. So you have a uh, distance from a point and an angle. And here the filter is defined in the polar coordinates. And what you do is you uh, basically apply a rotating filter and then take the maximum over all the possible orientations, right? Uh, and the final option is to do uh, isotropic filters. So in this case, the filter depends only on the radius. So basically, it has no sense of direction. It, uh, it, it looks like concentric circles. Um, I think there is a question. If one uh, in one manifold, we might then end up using many different transformations. Can we generalize that to, to one transformation for efficiency purposes? OK, so it's not many transformations. It's the ambiguity. So it's a kind of uh, uh, built-in property in the manifold. So what you want to do is somehow to deal with this ambiguity. Right, so uh, and these are the exactly the, the 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 different solutions. So you can either fix a gauge, right, and uh, uh, up to some ambiguities in the definition of the gauge and the entire possibility of doing it. You can say I fix the gauge and I I now work with this canonical gauge, right? Another possibility, for example, to say okay, my filter is not dependent on the orientation, so it doesn't uh, suffer from this ambiguity, and that's exactly what spectral analysis will do. So this will be isotropic filters. What Taco will show in his lecture that we can actually define a filter that uh, transforms the same way as you transform your local coordinates. So if I rotate my local frame, the filter will rotate in the same way, right? Same way as we had, for example, in convolutional networks, when uh, if I shift my filter, the output will be shifted in exactly the same way, right? So the notion of, uh, of group equivariance that we had before. Okay, so. The, of course, the deficiency of isotropic filters is that even though they uh, get rid of this ambiguity, they lose discriminative power because you use uh, uh, maybe more boring and less informative filters. OK, so let's now talk about deformation invariance. So this uh, I mentioned it as uh, the second kind of symmetry, right, or second kind of invariance that we have in our application. And I think this video describes it nicely. Here, I define an intrinsic filter on the, on the surface, and I want the result of the filter to be unaffected by deformations, right? Or at least by certain class of deformations. Okay. So let's uh, let us formalize it a little bit more. So let's say that we start with this manifold, right? Or a domain omega. And uh, we have another domain. So I deform omega into omega wave. And I describe this deformation by uh, a map uh, eta between uh, omega and omega wave. Okay. What I, now I will try to do is to locally characterize what this omega does to the structures on this domain, right? To tangent, tangent vectors, the metrics, and so on, to distances. So just a reminder, uh, what we want to do is the following thing. And uh, this, is the, 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 this is the classical case of Euclidean space. So if I have some function that goes from one domain to another, right, in Euclidean space, if I move a little bit from the point u to a point u plus x, right? I can say that now it will be mapped to uh, eta of u plus x. And what I can do, I can linearize my function. So I can say that there will be a new displacement that I can describe uh, 
right? Uh, ignoring some higher order terms, or if X is small, then this will be uh, this will be an accurate representation by uh, some uh, operator that we call the uh, the Jacobian, right? And that I denote here by nabla of eta. So uh, on manifold, we cannot do anything like this, right? I cannot add two points on the manifold. So I, I can, you can already anticipate that we'll need to work locally in the tangent space with tangent vectors. But just to give you uh, an important definition, so this difference between the, uh, the value of the function at point u plus x and the value of the function at u is called the differential, right? As the name suggests, it's the difference in the values of the function as a result of a small displacement. And you can see that I can describe it as uh, an operator that acts on the displacement. Right, so I moved by x, I will move in the output of the function by uh, a new displacement vector y that is given as the, this d eta of x that depends on the position u. Okay, so back to our manifolds. As I said, we cannot say something as naive as u plus x, right? We don't have this vector space structure, but we have it locally. So we have tangent space around point u, right? We have tangent space on the new manifold around point eta of u. Okay, now the differential or what is called the push forward map defines a map between the two tangent spaces, right? That's why we denote it by D eta subscript U to say that it's the differential point U, okay? Essentially what it allows us to do is to map tangent vectors from one manifold uh, to another, okay? Now, if I take two tangent spaces, uh, tangent vectors, uh, I can basically use the metric, the inner product, uh, 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 defined locally on the tangent space on, uh, uh, on omega wave to define a metric on the manifold omega, right? This is called the pullback metric. I denote it by, uh, uh, by eta star. So to recap, basically we assume that our eta is a deformorphism, some smooth map between, uh, between the two remaining manifolds with metrics G and H. The push forward is the differential. It, uh, it's a map between the, the tangent bundles of these manifolds. So uh, we can think of it as a small displacement in the tangent space from point U results in this displacement that is given by this uh, push forward in the tangent space around the uh, uh, eta of U. And the pullback of the metric is given in this way, right? So I take my tangent vectors, I map them to the new manifold with the push forward, I compute the metric on that manifold. And this gives me a metric on the manifold omega. So we say that we pull back the, the, the metric H from uh, omega wave to omega. And if this metric coincides at every point with the metric G, with the original metric that we had on the manifold omega, we say that this is an isometry. I will say that it's a Riemannian isometry to distinguish it from a different notion of isometry that I define in a second, okay? Is this notion clear? So I apologize, it's a little bit cumbersome, but that's the, the level of detail that you need to, to, to go into in order to define what does it mean that, that uh, the metric is the same at every point, right? So basically what, what is written here is that the metrics on omega and omega wave are the same, okay? That this map preserves metric. That's why we call it isometry. Isometry means, in Greek means equal metric. Right, so again, the, uh, the pullback and the push forward, so, the differential of the map maps uh, tangent vectors. Is this clear, right? So it tells you that if I displace a little bit from point U, it will result in a small displacement uh, from the point at U, right? And these displacements are different creatures. They live in different spaces, right? So one lives in the tangent space uh, on the one manifold, another one lives in the tangent space on another manifold. So if I now take, take two, vector, two tangent vectors, I can map them to the new manifold and I can uh, apply to them the remaining metric of that manifold. So this way we define the metric on the original manifold. And this is what we call the pullback metric, okay? So that's the idea. And if the pullback metric coincides with the metric that we had originally on the manifold, we say that this map is an isometry, okay? Now we also have another notion of metric, right? What we define, we call the geodesic distance. And here, given two Riemannian metrics, G and H, I can define the shortest path between two points, U and V, right? And measure the length of these paths, and this is my distance, right? And now we have a map between metric spaces, 
And if this map preserves distances or preserves the, the metric, right? Or if I uh, compose my metric with this, uh, uh, with this map and I get the same result, I say that this is a metric isometry, right? So it's a map that preserves geodesic distances. Now, why I uh, not insist I, uh, uh, on this distinction between metric uh, isometry and Riemannian isometry is the following result. So obviously, in one direction, a Riemannian isometry necessarily implies a metric isometry, right? Because the, the geodesic distance is intrinsic. It's defined purely in terms of a Riemannian metric. So if I have something that preserves a Riemannian metric, then the geodesic distances will be preserved and it will be automatically a metric isometry, right? So somehow, Riemannian isometry seems to be a stronger condition. But there is a result that is called the Meyer Steenrod theorem that uh, claims that on connected manifolds, uh, the opposite direction also works. So a metric isometry is also a Riemannian isometry. In other words, the two notions are equivalent, right? So that's why you can talk about an isometry in general. Now, I should say that isometries, we can also define them from the manifold to itself. And this is what is called the intrinsic symmetries. So these are some kind of structure preserving automorphisms, right? And in this case, the structure is either the, the Riemannian metric or the geodesic distance, which are equivalent. And uh, we can, on manifold, we can define um, uh, continuous symmetries that are generated by uh, special uh, fields that are called killing fields. So these are the local uh, generators of the isometry group on the manifold, right? So there is an entire theory, basically group theoretic perspective on, uh, on what are isometries on manifolds allow me not to go into this, um, in, uh, into this topic because we have uh, many other things to cover. Now, why this is important? So I remind you, uh, before when we talked about um, invariance and equivariance, we had the following idea, right? So we had a signal that is defined on some domain, and uh, we applied to it some group, uh, uh, we applied some group operation on the domain, right? That in the space of signals was uh, manifested through the group representation. So some linear operator that we applied to the signal, like the shift. And we said that we want a function that is, for example, invariant to this, to this, uh, uh, to these operations, right? Group equivariant function. Okay. Now here we have a different situation. So here we have instead of a signal deformation, we have a domain deformation. So here we have uh, now a different domain uh, omega wave, and now we are interested in a function that will be unaffected by the deformation of this domain, right? So and here what we showed is that if our deformation is an isometry, then uh, we must guarantee that we have an intrinsic function. It will be automatically isometry invariant. That's why I insist on uh, defining everything intrinsically. Okay, and of course this can be ex extended to an, an approximate case, like we had the notion of approximate group invariance and equivariance, we could say that if I have uh, an operator that is not exactly an element of the group, but close enough, right? Like remember this warping of the images that John showed, we can actually measure how far it is from a group. For example, we can measure the, the Dirichlet energy of uh, some, some smooth deformation field. So here we can do the same thing, right? We have a recipe here to quantify the distortion of this map. Basically, we can measure how far it is from an isometry. And there are multiple ways of doing it. So allow, again, uh, to skip uh, this detail. And what is important to say is that uh, intrinsic filters are invariant under uh, isometric deformations of the manifold. We can also show that they are, are approximately invariant under approximate isometries. So uh, in case of two-dimensional surfaces, isometries are inelastic deformations. So a good model is a piece of paper. You can bend it. You cannot tear it. You cannot stretch it, right? Paper is not stretchable. So if the paper had a little bit of elasticity, if it was a rubber plate, I could probably stretch it a little bit. So that would be an approximate isometry. And then the filters will not be exactly the same, but they will be approximately the same. OK, and this is important in applications such as computer vision and graphics, where, for example, we want to find correspondence between deformable shapes. When we want to do, for example, uh, different avatars of, of three-dimensional humans. Right? What you can see here, the two poses on the left are approximate isometries. And uh, a different person, for example, you see that the person has slightly fatter body. So this is not an isometry. So there is some distortion here. OK, now let's talk about the manifold Fourier transform. And we talked a little bit about isotropic filters. So that will be uh, the idea behind this uh, spectral uh, construction of filters. So to remind you, in the Euclidean case, we had um, 
uh, a proof that convolutions uh, commute, right? We could represent them as circulant matrices. And uh, we knew also that commuting matrices are jointly diagonalizable. So in this case, roughly speaking, they have same eigenvectors. And we could pick one of these matrices, the shifts operator, for which we could actually show by hand derived eigenvectors and show that they are equal to the discrete Fourier transform. And therefore, the conclusion was that convolutions are diagonalized by the Fourier transform. Okay. Now, instead of the shift operator, uh, operator we could pick up any uh, circulant matrix, any convolution. For example, we could pick up the Laplacian. The Laplacian operator, its eigenvectors are also DFT. So we can say that every convolution is diagonalized by the eigenvectors of the Laplacian operator. So we can use the Laplacian eigenvectors as the Fourier transform. Now, in the Euclidean case, it doesn't matter which matrix we choose. In the non-Euclidean case, it does. So here's a few facts about the Laplacian. So we can, again, think of Fourier basis functions that are Laplacian eigenfunctions. Let me write it in the continuous case, right? What is Laplacian in 1D is just second order derivative. So if I apply it to the complex exponential, right, to the, to the basis vectors of the Fourier transform, I will get back the same eigenvector scaled by some, some scalar, right? Uh, here it appears with minus sign, so that's why uh, in some references it's convenient to define the Laplacian as the negative derivative so it is a positive semi-definite operator. Now we can also interpret the Fourier basis as an orthogonal basis that minimizes the Dirichlet energy. So we can say that uh, basically when we build it progressively, the first eigenvector it has unit length, right? It's orthonormal basis, and it's the smoothest. So what is the smallest Dirichlet energy? It's zero, right? When the vector is constant, the next one must be orthogonal to this previous to the first vector. And uh, uh, the, the next uh, smallest Dirichlet energy, so orthogonality means that it must be uh, uh, orthogonality to the, the constant vector means that the integral over a full period must be equal to zero. It means uh, that uh, it must be a periodic function like sine, right? And that's how we get uh, the different frequencies of uh, uh, in the Fourier transform. So uh, we can think of it as the smoothest, uh, smoothest orthogonal basis. And finally, we can interpret it as a kind of local difference from neighbors. So if we look at the discrete Laplacian, you can see that, uh, well, up to normalization, what I do is essentially I take the average of my neighbors to the left and to the right and subtract for it the value at the point itself, at the point i, right? So bear in mind this uh, kind of definition or kind of intuition. We'll get back to it in a second. This is actually important. OK. So we need to define a few more things before we, uh, we uh, can define the analogy of Laplacian on manifolds. And the first is the notion of fields. So the scalar field is just a real function on the manifold. right? So think of a temperature. So I have a surface, and I can measure temperature at different points. So it's a scalar value. right? It's a, a number, a real number. Now, we can also have vector fields. So it's a function that uh, takes uh, every point and assigns uh, this point to a vector in the respective tangent, uh, tangent space, right? So you can roughly visualize it as a kind of a uh, lot of arrows locally that indicate local directions. OK, that's exactly the kind of intuition of what vector field is. You can describe the flow of stuff on the manifold. Now, the fields can be anything. So we can talk about tensor fields. So metric, uh, the Riemannian metric that we defined before is a tensor field, and so on and so forth. OK? So we can also equip these spaces with inner products. So technically speaking, this makes them into Hilbert spaces, right? And that's the, the, the way to define uh, an inner product. Between scalar fields, I just multiply the pointwise values of the scalar fields and integrate over the manifold, OK? Uh, with vector fields, these are directions, so I need to uh, to compute inner product within the, these directions, right? To make them into a scalar, I will use the Riemannian metric. So that's exactly what's written here: the Riemannian metric between x at point u and y at point u. And here I use the convention to denote scalar fields by lowercase letters and vector fields by uh, uppercase letters. Okay. So now let's ask the question. How do we measure the direction of the steepest increase of uh, a function or a field at point u? Right. So we know that uh, in classical calculus, uh, you probably know it better than me, that uh, this is exactly the notion of a gradient. And you probably also remember that the gradient is a vector of uh, array of uh, partial derivatives of function. Right. So how to do something similar on the manifold? 
So first of all, we already know how to do a directional DVT, right? So remember the notion of differential. So in this case, we have a function not between two manifolds, we have a function from a manifold to a Euclidean space, right? So this is our scalar field. So essentially the differential here can be interpreted as a directional derivative, how much my temperature changes if I make a displacement uh, along the tangent factor y at point u, right? So I apply this differential on, uh, on this factor. So the differential is a linear functional that acts on tangent factors. So this is what is called a dual vector. So it's a linear functional that takes a vector and spits out a scalar. Uh, we know from uh, 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 from functional analysis, this is a result that is known as the Ritz-Fréchet representation theorem, that every such linear functional can be represented as an inner product or the primal inner product with uh, some vector, the tangent vector. And this special vector has a name, the representation of the, the differential. Uh, we call this vector a gradient. So this is called the intrinsic gradient in differential geometry. Okay, so once again, if I want to measure the, uh, how the function changes as a result of a displacement in direction y, I can do it by taking an inner product of the gradient with this direction, right? What is important that this displacement is local, the inner product here is given by the Riemannian metric, but otherwise it's exactly the gradient that you know, right? So you probably know that the right way of thinking of the gradient is uh, from the linearization of a function, right? So it's not, again, it's not, an array of uh, partial derivatives of a function because partial derivatives depend on the choice of the basis, right? Here, we define it in an abstract way. So the intrinsic gradient is just a vector field uh, of the steepest increase of a scalar field X, right? So uh, we can uh, define a gradient operator. It's an operator that uh, makes scalar fields into vector fields by basically by producing these arrows that indicate locally into the direction in which uh, this function increases the most, same way as the standard Euclidean gradient does, okay? Now we can define uh, another operator that does the opposite. It turns vector fields into scalar fields and what it measures is the flow of a vector field through some infinitesimal ball, right? So again, think of some water flowing on your surface and you can measure whether water uh, emanates from a point or it sinks. Right, so sources and sinks are measured by the, diver the divergence. And what is important to realize that the divergence and the gradient operators are adjoint. So meaning that I can move them under inner product. Now pay attention that the inner products on the left and the right are not the same. The inner product on the right is inner product between scalar fields and divergence of a vector field gives me a scalar field that I can uh, take inner product with uh, the scalar field X and the inner product on the left is in a product between vector fields, right? I need to, to take a, a point-wise Riemannian metric. And finally, we define the Laplace Beltrami operator as, uh, and sorry that I didn't write it, as the divergence of the gradient. So it's an operator that takes uh, me from scalar fields to scalar fields, and it computes the local difference between the function and the point and uh, its average uh, neighbor value. And you can prove it in R2. You can also prove that it's a rotation environment in R2. What is important about the Laplace Beltrami or the Laplacian that it's intrinsic, it is self-adjoint or symmetric, right? If we uh, describe it as a matrix, it will be a symmetric matrix. As a result, it has real eigenvalues and orthogonal eigenvectors. Okay, and it's named after uh, uh, two people, uh, Pierre Simon de Laplace and Eugenio Beltrami. And I, I would say without exaggeration, this is probably one of the most important uh, operators that exist in mathematical physics. And you find it everywhere in differential equations that govern uh, diffusion processes, uh, quantum mechanics, uh, uh, fluid mechanics, and so on and so forth. So let me just give you one example, or actually two examples. So one of them is the heat equation. You probably know it from some basic course in differential equations. What it encodes essentially is what is, what is known as the Newton law of cooling. So that was a, a paper that Newton published anonymously in 1701. Uh, and uh, basically it states that the rate of change of temperature of an object is proportional to the difference in the temperatures between the object and its environment. So if I take a hot object and I put it in a cold room, then uh, the speed at which it will, uh, uh, it will cool will depend on the difference between, the, uh, between the, 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 the temperature of the object and the environment. So this is a differential way of expressing this, uh, this law. So the rate of change is the temporal derivative. X here 
is a, a family of functions uh, that uh, give the temperature at point u on the domain at time t, right? So the rate of change is temporal derivative. The difference from the environment locally differentiable is exactly the Laplacian, right? Because of this uh, uh, geometric interpretation. And the proportion coefficient is what is called the thermal diffusivity. Now, here's another differential equation where the Laplacian appears. This is the wave equation. Right, where, where does it come from? How we can derive the wave equation in 1D? You can think of it as a collection of masses connected by spring. Right, so the, the, basically what uh, governs this system is Newton's law that tells you that the acceleration is equal to the, to the force uh, multiplied by the mass. Right, and you can express the force, uh, uh, in this case, the force of elasticity through Hooke's law. Uh, again, locally it will be given by the Laplacian and the, uh, the the proportion coefficient here will be the wave propagation speed, right? So this is the wave equation. It first uh, in one D it was first discovered by by D'Alembert, and then in uh, multiple dimensions by Leonard Euler. So let's do this experiment. I don't know if you can hear it, but what you see here is a, a metal plate on which we put a thin uh, layer of sand, and now we apply uh, vibrations to it. So underneath this plate there is a, a vibrating mechanism for which you can change the frequency. And you see that as we change the frequency, at some special frequencies, these patterns form. You see it, so these are standing waves. Now, these kind of experiments, I'm just reproducing uh, with modern technology, what was shown in 1794 by German physicist Ernst Kladny, who thought of this as a, a cute way of uh, trying to understand how sound look, looks like. And he conjectured that, uh, for example, great violins by Stradivari, for example, would uh, look differently uh, with this experiment from, let's say, a cheap violin that doesn't sound well. Now, at that time, he didn't really understand what's going on. Uh, but now, of course, we do. So uh, what happens here is, again, the wave equation. So here I'm showing the, the simple wave equation with unit propagation speed. So the way we solve it is by separation of variables. So we assume that the solution is given by the product of a, a spatial function and a temporal function, I denoted by phi and tau. And if we plug it into the equation and rearrange the terms, I get this, right? So this must be uh, true for every t and every u. So we can just call it a constant that I denote by lambda, okay? And what is written here in the right-hand side is that uh, the Laplacian of phi equals lambda phi. So physicists call this the Helmholtz equation, so this describes the spatial part of the solution. And this is essentially the Laplacian eigenfunction, right? So these standing waves that we observed in this experiment are essentially the vibration modes of the plate and uh, the lambdas are the vibration frequencies. So what happens is that at some resonant frequencies, uh, the, you, uh, you get standing waves. So these are the zero crossings of the eigenfunctions where the, the grains of sand do not jump. That's why you get these standing patterns. Okay, and this is how we can do, of course, we cannot maybe do this experiment with sand, but we can compute the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on any surface or any domain. And this is how they look like. So, well, some technical detail that if the manifold is compact, in other words, well, uh, compactness is a little bit elaborate notion, but roughly speaking, uh, uh, every physical object uh, is, a comp is a compact manifold, uh, it has countable eigen decomposition. So it has discrete frequencies. It doesn't have any continuous frequency. And what is important that again, a Laplacian is intrinsic operator, so its eigenfunctions are intrinsic. They do have some ambiguity, for example, uh, uh, there might be some sign flips, but they are isometry invariant, at least in theory, right? So if I deform this shape, I will get the same Laplacian eigenvectors. Again, in theory, we'll actually see that this is not the case because we never really have uh, exact isometries and they appear to be quite unstable under approximate isometries. Okay, so this allows us, we have an analogy now of the Fourier basis. So this allows us to define the Fourier transform on manifolds and apologize that I'm running a little bit out of time. I'll probably need uh, 10 more minutes. So hopefully it's okay. So same way as we have the Fourier transform, which is essentially an inner product of a signal with the basis function. So here it is. It's an inner product of a signal with the Laplacian eigenfunctions. The inverse Fourier transform will be uh, just the uh, summation of these uh, uh, Fourier coefficients multiplied by the, uh, by the basis functions, right? Same way as we had before. So it allows us to decompose scalar fields in an orthogonal basis. And essentially, 
work with these coefficients now, we forget about the manifold, right? So once I computed the Fourier transform, once I computed the Laplacian and its eigenbasis, I can project my signal on these bases. I don't need to think of the manifold anymore, right? I now work with these coefficients. So this is the really the, the greatness and the convenience of free analysis that it completely abstracts out the underlying object. Now, of course, the drawbacks that, that you can already see that the notion of frequency here, right? The frequency here is the eigenvalue of the Laplacian. It doesn't have any directionality. It's one dimensional. So there are some attempts to, to uh, attach some more interesting geometry to the, to the spectral domain uh, on non-Euclidean spaces, but it's complicated and uh, it is not natural. So naturally, we can just order the eigenvalues in the increasing uh, order, and uh, that's why they are one dimensional. So this also gives us a way to define co convolution, what we call spectral convolution, same way as we have this property that, uh, that Fourier transform maps convolutions into pointwise products, we can define convolution as pointwise products of Fourier transforms, right? Like shown here. Now, there are some drawbacks. We'll see that uh, when we discretize it, uh, we will not have any free, fast Fourier transform algorithm. So it will have quadratic complexity. Uh, there is one drawback as well that typically uh, you cannot easily guarantee that filters are localized, right? Well, we can, but uh, it's not straightforward. And the filters are isotropic. So because we don't have the notion of direction, this is how the filter will look like uh, in, uh, in the plane. So you see that it has radial symmetry. And of course, we said that uh, it is isometry invariance, but in practice, we don't really have true isometries. So it is unstable under deformations. And let me show you what I mean by this. So let's say that this is our manifold, the horse. Here we have a signal. So we have some spots on the, on the horse, right? Now let's do some filtering. So we do spectral filter as I described before. So this will do some form of edge detection, right? So I, de I define the coefficients of this filter that I denote by alpha that they will take this signal into this signal, okay? Now, what in your opinion will happen if I start deforming this domain, even approximately isometric, isometrically? So I will allow the course to, to run. What you will see that the result of the filter is completely different. It completely breaks down. So again, I have a different domain as a result, different Laplacian, different eigenvectors, but I apply the same spectral coefficients, alpha. So you see that the result is dramatically different. And this is exactly manifestation of this instability. Now, that's why uh, Fourier transforms are rarely used in this way, or at least you cannot transfer coefficients from one domain to another. There are better ways. So one of the ways is to think of a, a spectral transfer function. So I define a, a function p hat that I apply to my Laplacian operator. And when I say that I apply a function to the operator, I don't mean that I apply to element element y is applied to its eigenvalues. So it's a kind of filter or a transfer function, same way as you have on your, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, equalizer in the audio system, right? So you have, for example, uh, in an equalizer, you can, uh, uh, you can reduce or enhance certain frequencies, right? So if I want to enhance the buses of my music, this is the kind of filter I will apply, right? So I have enhancement of the buses here, I have some drop in the mid frequency and I have enhancement of the high frequency, right? So this is a kind of filter. So we can interpret this p hat in this way as a transfer function. Now, uh, I can also interpret it as, basically this is a way of prescribing my coefficients. So this is exactly the same spectral convolution I had before. And we see that it's uh, deformation invariant, right? So this way, if I define this filter and it has some nice properties, it's, it, for example, it is, it is smooth. In this case, I define it as a low pass filter that decays with frequency, I will get something that is stable. Now, another way uh, to interpret it is the following. So if I write the inner product explicitly and exchange sum with the integral, what I get here is this kind of kernel, psi of uv, which you can think of it as a kind of convolution kernel that is position dependent, right? So I don't have a true convolution because convolution is the same shared filter. Here it is different, it depends on u, but uh, I can localize it at every point. And just as a semi check, when I have the Euclidean case, my Laplacian eigenfunctions will become the complex exponentials. And because of their, associ uh, uh, their associativity, I can bring them together. Now the, the, the kernel Psi will depend on the difference between U and V rather than on U and V together. 
yeah, so uh, the, there is a question about the direction. Should it be the same? So you don't have any direction. You see that basically it spreads uniformly in every direction. So I should say that we can define uh, anisotropic filters on, on many phones, but it requires some notion of local direction or a gauge. So we are back to the to the previous to the previous problem. So the moment you want to to, to have any directionality, you need some form of uh, uh, local reference frame. Okay, so let me move on. Uh, let's say a few words about the discretization. So in practice, of course, you don't have many folds, so you need to discretize them. A standard way to do it is using meshes, and in particular, triangular meshes. So a triangular mesh is a graph with some extra structure. So in addition to nodes and edges, we also have faces. So remember, nodes are points, edges are pairs of points, in this case, undirected. Faces are triplets of points, such that every uh, element in this uh, in this triangle is uh, a node and every uh, side of the triangle is an edge okay and we also need in order to be to uh, differential geometry to be discretized correctly we also need to guarantee uh, manifoldness property which means that uh, each edge must be shared by exactly two faces and the boundaries of all triangles uh, that are incident on the node uh, must form a single loop so just to give you an example what i show here on the left are manifold meshes what I show on the right are non-manifold meshes that have these degeneracies. Okay. Now I can also embed my mesh, and that's uh, that's exactly when I say that I have a two-dimensional surface in three-dimensional space. I can attach coordinates to my uh, to my nodes, and by virtue of these coordinates, I can also measure the length of the edges simply using the Euclidean metric, right? And now we have a discrete metric, the the length of the edges. I can say that intrinsic properties are properties that are expressible in terms of this L, and isometries are deformations that preserve L. So here, allow me to reveal a secret. There are no isometric deformations except trivial ones uh, for meshes except uh, some uh, unique pathological examples. So meshes or polyhedral surfaces in general tend to be rigid. So that's why we don't have true isometries. I cannot really deform this horse uh, preserving the length of the edges. That's why this deformation stability is crucial uh, in meshes, in graphs as well. Okay, now this is how we define the Laplacian, right? So that, that's a proper discretization of the of the Laplacian operator on meshes. So I can, uh, oops, somebody's drawing here. So uh, um, basically, I took the, I take the difference between the the, the coordinates of. Uh, 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 at point U and point V, and multiplied by uh, a weight that I attach to each uh, edge. Now, the way that I define this edge determines the kind of Laplacian I uh, uh, I define, right? And there, uh, that's why there is no, I, I don't say the Laplacian, I say a Laplacian. There are many Laplacians that, that you can define, and actually none of them, you can prove that none of them uh, can satisfy all the properties of the continuous one. So there is uh, this result from 2007, uh, proven by Max Vardetsky, uh, they call it the no free lunch theorem. Now, if you look at this sum, if I write it slightly differently, you see that I can take the x uh, u out, and uh, this is called the degree, the sum of the, the, the weights of the edges that emanate from no u. And you can see that this is the value up to some normalization, the value of the function at point u minus the average, again, weighted average of the neighbors. Right, so that's exactly the geometric interpretation of the Laplacian as the difference of the function uh, from its uh, local average. Yeah, okay, so thank you for uh, allowing to, uh, me to take, uh, take some more time. I, I don't need more than five minutes. Okay, and that's why we can express the Laplacian as an n by n matrix. In this case, it's just a degree matrix, right? The diagonal matrix, uh, which uh, collects the degrees uh, free, uh, of each node minus the matrix of uh, the weights. Okay, and it is typically sparse, at least for meshes. Meshes are sparse, so it has an uh, order of the number of uh, edges, uh, uh, non zero elements, right? So it, it will contain mostly zeros. That's why multiplying by this matrix uh, is typically computationally efficient. So a particular kind of Laplacian that is used for meshes is what is called the cotangent formula. So uh, it is very, very old, actually. The first uh, reference that I'm aware of when it was uh, derived was by McNeil in his PhD thesis from 49. So he used an, uh, an analog electronic computer 
to, to do some computations with uh, with uh, circuits, and he used this formula in that application. But modern uh, uh, incarnation of this formula is uh, from the papers from the 90s by Pinkel and Potia. So cotangent formula uh, tells you that the weight should be the average of the cotangents of the two angles of the triangles opposite to the edge. And that's where manifoldness is important because we know that there are exactly two triangles that share this edge. Okay, And I normalize by the area of the local area element, which is usually computed as uh, uh, the uh, area of the polygon that is formed by the various centers of the triangles. Or alternatively, you can compute it as one third of the sum of the areas of the triangles using some simple uh, uh, Euclidean geometric identities. Now, at the first glance, this formula uh, contains some information that is not intrinsic, right? What is a cotangent of an angle? I have no idea what it is, but uh, you can show that you can express this formula entirely in terms of the, uh, of the discrete metric of the length of the edges. So it's completely intrinsic, as well as the, uh, as the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the area element. Uh, there is an uh, ancient formula from uh, from ancient Greeks, current semi-perimeter formula, where you can express the area of a triangle using the semi-perimeter of this triangle, uh, the expression that I give here. So bottom line, it's intrinsic. Therefore, if I were able to deform the mesh without affecting, affecting the discrete metric L, I would get exactly the same Laplacian as a result, the same eigenvectors. Uh, the problem is that in practice, of course, it's never a true isometry. That's why we have these disasters that we've seen. Okay, now there is nothing really specific to a mesh here, and I can compute Laplacian on a graph, and typically it's computed using the adjacency weights. So if I have a graph with adjacency, let's say ones, if I have an edge and uh, zero, if I don't have an edge, it's defined in exactly the same way, right? And you can see here, I remember what Petra described in his talk, this linear local permutation invariant aggregators uh, that we denoted by phi, that uh, um, that that uh, takes uh, the uh, features of the neighbor nodes and aggregates them with the features of the of the node itself. So here is a, a particular way, a linear aggregation that uh, uh, that we do here. We take our node uh, uh, u, take its features, multiply by the degree, and subtract the weighted average of the neighbors. You see that it's also a symmetric function, right? It's permutation invariant, but when I average my neighbors. I don't care about their order, right? I can uh, average them in any order I want. And as a result, uh, uh, Laplacian of uh, feature matrix is a permutation equivalent linear function that can be defined on a graph. So it's a particular instance, basically it's a convolutional flavor. So I should say that uh, this link between spectral analysis on graphs or on manifolds and uh, graph neural networks uh, is old and uh, has been uh, explored in previous works. So some of the early uh, uh, papers are, I'm aware about spectral filter, filtering on meshes in computer graphics, probably the works of Gabriel Taubin from the 90s uh, and Tsahi Karni and Craig Goldsman from 2000. Uh, there, there is an entire field of graph signal processing with uh, uh, important representatives, uh, for example, Pierre van der Gains and, uh, and Jose Mura. They have uh, two uh, position papers on, on, on this topic from 2013. And actually, the, this was the first approach, uh, Joanne's paper on uh, the spectral graph neural networks that was, at least to me, a revival of interest in graph neural networks in the modern uh, era of deep learning, uh, used exactly the graph Fourier transform with the drawbacks that I described that it has high computational complexity and this lack of stability under perturbation. So the polynomial filters, right, the spectral filter that I described, uh, or the, the Chevnet, the work of Michael de Ferrar from 2016, very popular paper in the field. We also had a, a version where we used instead of polynomial uh, functions, we used rational functions. That was the work of uh, Ron Levy from 2018, and also a bunch of results on the stability of such spectral filters. Meaning that if I perturb the graph a little bit, I can show that the filter will not change dramatically. So we don't have these disasters that happen uh, as I showed in the example of the galloping horse. Okay. So this is the graph Fourier transform, right? So that's exactly the same thing as I uh, showed before. Let me just now express it with uh, matrices. So I can decompose uh, the Laplacian into orthogonal eigen decomposition. Phi will be the orthogonal matrix containing the eigenvectors as columns. 
lambda is a diagonal matrix containing the eigenvalues. And I can define the graph Fourier transform as just projection, basically inner product through this matrix. It has a squared complexity, right? It's a dense matrix. I don't have any redundant structure, so I cannot use an FFT. The computation of the eigenvectors, the diagonalization of the Laplacian is almost n cube complexity. So I should add to it some pre computation that is even more expensive. Inverse graph Fourier transform, I multiply by phi instead of phi transpose. And spectral convolution is, uh, again, is uh, the pointwise product of the Fourier transforms. So I have the filter and the signal. I compute uh, their Fourier transforms, uh, dot them, and then compute the inverse Fourier transform. A way of writing it is arranging the coefficients of the Fourier transform of psi into a diagonal matrix and multiplying uh, uh, the Fourier transform of x by this diagonal matrix, and then taking the inverse Fourier transform. Okay, so it all has, uh, sorry, it should be n and not n squared. So the, the well, if I count the inverse Fourier transform, then it's n squared. So if we use this different approach of uh, applying spectral transfer functions, so uh, a particularly uh, convenient choice is a polynomial filter. So that was the work of the Ferrar, where they use polynomial of degree R applied to the graph of Plassian. So I remind you that when I say that I apply a polynomial to a matrix, it means that I need to apply it to the eigenvalues of the matrix. And that's how it looks like, right? So I have the, the, the eigenvectors. And here, uh, because the matrix is diagonal, I can apply it to every element of the matrix, which is essentially the same as taking uh, lambda, the, the, the matrix of the eigenvalues, to the power of L in this polynomial. And you can see that because of linearity, I can rearrange the terms here. It's essentially equivalent to taking the powers, the L power of the Laplacian. So you see that I don't need any explicit eigen decomposition anymore, right? Because I can write it like this. It simply amounts to applying powers of the graph of Laplacian, and because usually the graph of Laplacian is sparse, right? So it has uh, uh, roughly order of n non-zeros, right? Or more correctly, order of the number of edges. I need to do it r times, and I can uh, store my previous results, uh, reuse them, so I apply the Laplacian uh, each time. Uh, just the, just the one power of the Laplacian, so it's r uh, the, multiplied by the number of edges. What we also guarantee that the filters are local because Laplacian is local, and its r power means that I have r support for uh, for the, the kernels obtained this way, and it's also nicely stable under deformations, as was shown in uh, multiple papers. And we can also see that these spectral filters essentially boil down to simple local averaging. So it's the convolutional flavor of graph neural networks. So some, some references make this distinction between spectral graph neural networks and spatial graph neural networks. You see that there is no difference. So it's exactly the same thing. It's just a different way of looking at, uh, at the same thing. Now, let me finish with uh, one last observation. So in graph signal processing, there is uh, this, uh, these two schools um, which in Euclidean sense, um, uh, in Euclidean case, the case uh, do not make any distinction, but here they do. Uh, remember that we could say that we can diagonalize convolution by eigenvectors of any uh, circle of matrix. So we could took, we could take the the shift operator, or we could take the Laplacian, right? So we took the Laplacian, and this uh, 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 this is what I described in the last half an hour. We could do uh, another thing. So this is our shift operator, right? This is how it looked like. You can see essentially that the shift operator is the adjacency matrix of this ring graph. Do you see it here, right? So this is how the adjacency looks like. It's the regular graph, so it's not it's not symmetric. Now, what I can if I look at a convolution, so this is my circuit matrix. I can represent it as a linear combination of the powers of the shift operator. So convolution essentially it's uh, shift multiply by a coefficient, shift multiply by a coefficient, and then add, uh, add everything up. So that's exactly what you see here. So, uh, and because of this uh, uh, identity between the, the adjacency matrix and the shift operator, I take here the powers of the adjacency matrix. So what I write here is a polynomial with respect to the adjacency matrix. So it's exactly the same what I showed you before, right? So before we apply the polynomial to the Laplacian, here I apply the polynomial to the adjacency matrix. It produces different results because I use here a different matrix, but the idea is exactly the same. So that was the, the approach that was adopted by, by Mura in, uh, in, in their approach to graph signal processing. And it also gave rise to some 
popular uh, graph neural network architecture, such as the GCN, the Graph Convolutional Network, the work of Thomas Kiff and Max Welling, uh, that uh, was they presented actually as a simplified version of the Chebyshev network. But this is probably the simplest uh, model you can imagine for graph neural networks, and that is used as one of the standard baselines. And the idea here is the following: that if you arrange the uh, node-wise features into a matrix X, right, which I remind you requires some ordering of the nodes, you can do two things. You can uh, transform each node feature vector uh, by a shared uh, uh, matrix of weights in a linear way, right? So it's node-wise transformer denoted by W. This amounts to right-wise multiplication of the matrix X. And then you can diffuse these features on the graph by left-wise multiplication by the graph Laplacian or the adjacency matrix, right? So this is how the simplest convolutional layer of a graph neural network might look like. And you can, of course, apply multiple such layers by just concatenating them, maybe interleaved with a, a nonlinear function. And here's an example of a two-layer graph neural network that does node-wise classification with softmax, OK? So one thing that you can see is that if you remove this uh, nonlinearity, you can collapse the adjacency matrices and the node-wise transforms. And basically, you get a power of the uh, of the diffusion matrix. Uh, basically, you diffuse twice if you want, and then of course uh, the, the learnable weight matrices can be absorbed into a single one. So you have a single W. And this is called simplified graph convolutional network. Uh, with um, my collaborators at Twitter, we took this uh, idea to the extreme. We said, what if we have multiple such operators doesn't need to be they don't need to be powers of uh, of the justice it can be anything actually here we can incorporate some directionality for example looking at some graph substructures for graph motifs right so for each of these operators we have a different set of weights and what is nice that we can pre-compute these pre-diffused features and from here on once we did this pre-computation all the rest looks like a multi-layer perceptron so this is a single uh, convolutional layer graph neural network we call it sign because it resembles inception modules in uh, in a Google CNN architecture. And surprisingly, it produces very competitive results, even though it's extremely scalable, extremely fast to train, because essentially it's a multi-layer perceptron with just some uh, simple pre-computation. So it is also a nice uh, baseline. It's not, of course, state of the art, but uh, it is very easy to implement, and you can find it uh, in PyTorch uh, geometric. So. To summarize, these are the, the different recipes that we've seen for non-Euclidean convolution. So I, I talked about uh, fixing the gauge, doing uh, pooling uh, locally, doing isotropic filters, and doing spectral analysis on manifolds. So in the next lecture, uh, Taco will describe uh, in full-blown theory of gauge equivariant filters and how it generalizes beyond manifolds. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. And please let me know if you have any questions.